ladies and gentlemen, who did make a start, just come up to 11 o'clock. Um, can I formally welcome uh, members and members of the public to the February meeting of the uh, combined authority? Before uh, moving into the detail of the meeting, just a few housekeeping <coughs> points as usual. First of all, can I remind everyone that all my mobile phones should be turned into silence uh, for the duration of the meeting? And to ensure that everyone in the chamber can hear the debate, can I please ask members and people presenting to use the microphones provided? And as usual, the meeting will be filmed by officers from the Climate Authority and will be available on the Mosley Council YouTube channel later today. So, uh, those are the uh, preliminaries. So, formally into item one, apologies. Do, do we have any apologies? No, no apologies, just the Okay, thank you. Um, item two is declarations of interest. Can I ask, have any declarations of interest been received? Not received, Chair. Okay, thank you. On to item three, which is the minutes of the last meeting of the combined authority held on the uh, 23rd of January 2015. Um, they are in the agenda pack, pages one to ten. Can I ask, are these approved as a correct record of that meeting? Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, on to the, the first substantive item, item four, uh, transport for the north. And this is going to be an update on this um, initiative. And I think uh, Darren Kirkman um, is going to speak to this. Darren, thank you. Responded by forming uh, the One North uh, initiative. <coughs> that um, that work recognised that yes, the cities of the North are collectively um, small by international comparison, but London is dominant city region, and that um, really the cities of the North to to increase that performance, they need to work more closely together and to adopt a European model. Uh, the diagrams there show. The, the Rhine Ruhr in Germany compared to the, um, the north of England, and in the Rhine Ruhr you have a lot of small cities quite close together. You also have much better levels of connectivity, speed, and frequency of, of transport connections, and you have um, complementary um, economic basis as you do in the north of England. And, and the, the basic premise of the work is that the north of England needs to work more closely together to create a single deep economic uh, unit. North proposition um, proposes improvements to road and rail capacity and on inland waterways. It addresses both passenger and freight capacity um, and recognises the importance of properly <coughs> the, the North's ports uh, more closely into the transport infrastructure to uh, improve our economic future. It also proposes a programme of intracity. Um, connectivity improvements so that it wasn't just city centres that benefited from, from the one-off proposal but uh, people living throughout the, the city region and that this was connected to HS2 so that people from across the, 
a wider area that could enjoy the benefits from high speed rail. And on HS2, clearly the Liverpool City Region has an aspiration for a direct, direct connection to the HS2 network, and we've got demonstrated the strong economic benefits that would flow from such a connection. Uh, clearly, the, the One North work with a focus on east west connectivity provides us with um, an avenue with which to realise that aspiration, and we've been encouraged by government to pursue this and to see One North and HS2 is very closely connected. So, David Higgins' second report um, recognised the work that's been done as part of One North and called for the creation of a new group called Transport for the North made for the, the, well, led by the North cities, representing all of the North, uh, to develop a Northern transport strategy alongside HS2, <coughs> safety and network rail. Clearly the work we've done as part of One North is a key input into that. Um, for the Liverpool City Region, we have two key objectives that we're looking to achieve as part of this work. The first is a commitment to a high-speed east-west line which from Liverpool, um, which connects onto HS2, providing east-west and north-south connectivity, and which is capable of accommodating full 400 metre trains into Lime Street. There's also a recognition of the importance of Liverpool to and Seaport, and uh, a commitment to ensure that we get the infrastructure and capacity necessary to ensure that freight uh, meets our, the region's growth aspirations. Something briefly on, on governance. I want to this, but the institution is represented at all levels from the, the partnership board uh, and the executive team, which is represented both by the institution and, and by the LEP. Um, and the institution also leads on the, the freight work stream and the freight is, is represented on the, on the program board. In terms of what happens next? We're currently working to produce an interim report in advance of the budget, which is the middle of March. Um, that report will be signed off by the, uh, the exec team before it goes to um, the FT and to Treasury, and we'll ensure that all members of the Federal Authority um, see that report before, before it goes anywhere. Um, it's intended that the interim report will secure approval from government for a joint Transport for the North, the FT feasibility study uh, to look again at the, the <coughs> ITP rail offer for the Liverpool City region, taking into account uh, East West, HS2, and our aspirations for freight. And then the intention is that a final detailed report will be complete uh, in 12 months' time in March 2016. That's all I have to say. I'm happy to take any, any questions. Okay, just before we bring people in, can I just ask Liam, Sheriff, Liam Roberts and Sheriff Major, do you, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, more than happy to, thanks Phil. Yeah, really just to kind of say that obviously this is an update and this is nothing new to, to members of the command authority, but to labour the point that, that Darren made very well, that we have a fantastic opportunity within the One North proposition actually to get a significant improvement <coughs> or connections for the Liverpool City region, particularly around high-speed rail connections. That opportunity of getting a full high-speed link into the city region, which will fulfil both our east-west requirements connecting to the other big city regions and across to the east coast, but also linking onto HS2 to give us that north-south high-speed connections, really is a very significant opportunity. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of very detailed work that we've been doing specifically on that, feeding that into the process, and that has been heard very well and very receptively. So obviously we await um, the final interim report will come back and it will be shared with members of the combined authority. But really just to lay the point, there's some very good progress and detailed work on all of that accordingly. Okay, uh, okay thanks, Liam. Um, members, any questions, comments, Roberts? Yeah, just building on that point, really, that first of all, I'm very pleased indeed, very gratifying to see the uh, Mersey Travel and the City Region right at the heart of this one more discussion <coughs> with the working level on the, on the policy board itself. Finally, important to get this connection. We will understand the position of the Liverpool and what can come through the line of the Northern Economy, the Northern Powerhouse, and the development of the North West. I think also in that context uh, is the, the freight position touched on by Darren briefly there, but uh, one, of our, one of our unique
lead selling ports, I think one of the last several lead selling ports, <coughs> is the great connection from Liverpool to. And that really is something the North West needs, but the wider North is going to benefit from that. And I think we can sell that strongly and therefore drive all the connection East West Liverpool Manchester or directly into the port there to ensure those goods get to market more quickly for the benefit of the whole of the Northern England and the balance of the wider economy. On that port, uh, just last Friday, at the Secretary of State of Transport, Patrick McLaughlin, was, was in Liverpool. He was the port. He was blown away by what he saw in terms of the port's his aspirations. The impact and development it will mean for the port, it will uh, increase capacity by threefold by a quarter of 2015. But more than that, it is the link to the North of England. And that can connect that argument into that wider one north position. And that, I think, is, is vital for us. He then went to see uh, the Nokia Industrial Park, it's one of the National Distribution Centre, hugely impressed again by what's happening on that park, creating new jobs. But more than that, it's uh, developing that logistics centre on which this economy will <coughs> go forward with great advances in the coming months and years. It's all part of that wider story. So freight, connections east-west, one or HS2, HS3, all complex stuff, but right in the heart of it. Finally, it would be unthinkable not to have the Liverpool City at the heart of any strategy, which includes a strategy for the wider north of England. Okay, and Joe? Okay. Chair, thank you. The, <coughs> I was at the visit with, with, with him and, uh, at the Super Bowl, uh, and we made a presentation to him uh, about the impact of the Super Bowl. We, we, we made a presentation to him about HS2 and HS3. What struck me is exactly what I've been saying for, uh, for several months now, uh, in fact for longer, is that we can make all the presentations we want to the manager that this is a political decision. And it really emphasises the need because, in fairness to him, uh, he was blown away, not by the figures and the facts and things, but just by seeing it himself. By understanding that if we don't um, do something about the increase in freight that's coming through Superpor and the need to get that across and out of the city to the corridors that are available to us, the multimodal, but equally the HS2 HS3 connection. We're going to have car parts of the M62, we're going to have car parts of the M6 in those corridors. And also the investment that we're going to have to make, make and support to make the point to accommodate the HS2 into Lion Street, we're going to have to develop and invest in there. So it was actually making those points and showing it the presentation visually that the penny drop. And that's, that comes back to my importance that yes, we can have all of the information and all the detail, but it's who we present it to and who we lobby and who we take it to. So, you know, whilst me and, uh, and, and yourself make the point about, you know, we're, we're making the case, it's whether it's getting listened to. And that's, you know, something that we've got to constantly do is make the case politically to both the, this government currently and a future government that are respective of what colour. We've got to continue to make the case strong politically about the need for it and it comes back to the rebalance in the economy about the northern uh, gateway, the northern investment, the one north and all of those. If you're serious about that, then we've got to also rebalance the spend and that includes investing to make sure that Liverpool and the connection between West and East takes place. So I just make that point just simply because it is okay, Alan, you know, or wads of documents, but no one's reading them. They don't count for them much. Okay, okay anybody else uh, wish to roll it? Just, just on that one point, actually, seeing is believing, uh, as they keep it, because he saw the, the scale of it all, and he couldn't really, he couldn't get that impression just by reading the papers. In fact, uh, we hope that in, in, in April we'll have visits by senior civil service and CLG, this and Treasury, again to show them what we, can, what we can offer, how we can change our economy and that of the wider law. And therefore that, um, that conversation and bringing them to, to Liverpool and seeing what we have is vital. And that process is in the hand now. We appreciate it to, to our champion here from, uh, from the central government just to, to ensure that that happens and to raise this to a senior representative from the departments. Again, seeing as Very good. Okay. So um, can we, can I first of all thank Darren for the uh, presentation. Uh, I think we're going to have uh, a further report on this at the combined authority meeting on the 6th of March. Um, and 
and uh, I think we can take on board the comments that members have made, um, and I look forward to making, hopefully, some rapid progress. So can we agree that? Okay, thanks, thanks Darren. Thank you. Great. Um, so that, that takes us on to item five, which is the Liverpool City Region Growth Plan top-up announcement. And uh, Mike Palin from the left is going to take us through this. Please, Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the members will be aware that uh, in July of last year, um, the government announced a £232 million for the city region. This was the growth deal announcement, which on the same day also included investments in uh, Centre City and some funding for a business growth hub. In September, the Minister for Cities, Greg Clark, came to the city region and signed the documents. And then in December, during the autumn statement, we had further success when up to £700 million pounds of road investment strategy uh, to be allocated to projects in the city region. In January of this year, government announced a bit of top-up to the growth deal. So this is a relatively small uh, amount of money compared to the previous announcements. But it's quite important because this is devolved to the city region level to be administered at city region level. So the three elements announced uh, in January were a £15.6 million pound capital fund, uh, £15.6 million pounds towards business growth, and a £0.4 million pound allocation to low carbon development. In terms of the capital fund, this is part of Strategic Project E within the growth plan. So this is complementary funding alongside existing European funds and also existing loan funds in the city region, such as Growing Places Fund. The key issues with this funding source are that we need to have a pipeline developed. So government expects us to have business cases ready to secure this funding. I'd like to thank Liverpool and Wirral who both provided example uh, business cases that helps us justify the, the total allocation. Um, we need to get the alignment of this funding with other products, absolutely right, to make sure that we maximise the number of jobs they create. And a message that the, the developer community is clearly giving to the left currently is we need to target the funds very carefully. They, they fear that we may be subsidising rents. Uh, so in effect, that by putting grant funding into a particular scheme, it discourages the market from investing in the area at the same time. <coughs> So we need to very carefully target the funding going forward. In terms of business growth, this was intended to be an extension of the very successful business growth grant programme we have to date. So £50 million pounds was bid for by the left from the Regional Growth Fund. Um, we are anticipating 104 projects will receive funding through this programme, as in the current programme that we've already got. £93 million pounds worth of private sector investment will be leveraged and over 2,500 jobs will be created. And it has funded projects in every single district of the city region. So very quickly, I'll, I'll come back to Sea Drill and, and Smiley separately. But um, Contract Chemicals, which you can see on the East Lance Road as you're driving out of Liverpool, they received um, funding and have already created 25 jobs. They are a specialist chemical firm producing chemicals for the food industry. Um, WSR Recycling in Holton, there was some media coverage around there, their investment, positive media coverage. They're creating 10 jobs in Holton. <coughs> WJ Leach in Sefton, they actually are a supplier to the logistics industry. So these are jobs being created as a result of the growing super um, um initiative. Um, I think Councillor Dowd attended the, that business to, to visit them when, we, when the funding was announced. Again, job creation off the back of a growing market in I said we need to target the funds better going forward. So these are two examples where we, where we can look to um, learn from to target the funds better going forward. So Sea Drill um, is a, an international offshore engineering company. They needed a UK time zone for their call center operations, their engineering call center. These are not standard call center jobs, these are high value jobs. They considered multiple sites within the UK and then they chose to come here to Liverpool, 90 high value jobs, and they are physically moving into this building as we speak. They are renting floors upstairs. So it's a real good case study for the city region. Another type of business we need to target are those that are exporting manufacturers. So Smile is based in the world, uh, exports around the world, they export British food products. 
So they, they actually trade off being a British food producer. They've already created 30 new jobs as a result of the investment. So the key issues for the business growth elements are the state aid rules have changed since the previous program. So we've got to think about how we support the biggest businesses because they can no longer access funding in the same way. We need to get fit right with other products, learn from our experience, and be better more client-facing in the way we do things. If we look at the distribution of projects by local authority area, certain authorities um, have had more projects than others. So we need to learn from that best practice. So, for example, Nosley had a particular high number of businesses that benefited. Um, Nosley actually employed a consultant to help individual businesses access the funding source. So we need to learn from that best practice. We also need to promote the product better. Now that we have this funding in place, we need to get out there and tell businesses it's available. And on the low carbon project, this is a relatively small amount of money in recognition that we have uh, significant potential in low carbon and energy projects. But we've not yet done all the feasibility work. So there's four schemes listed there on the, on the slide where government has part funded some feasibility work. We want to learn from that, uh, from the, the lessons from that investment and develop more schemes in the city region. Finally, some overall issues and some next steps. Members need to be aware that this funding, as currently programmed, does not begin to 2016-17. So we need to ask government if there's any flexibility in bringing the funding forward. These initiatives would ideally start next year, next financial year, to help businesses. All of this spend has to be processed through an assurance framework. This is a procedural um, process that. Government, if they're confident we're applying it in the right way, will devolve more funding to us. So that will have to come back to the CA in due course. There's also the outstanding issue between capital and revenue splits. Although we're receiving capital funding, there is no management pot available to us at this time. So we have to think quite carefully about how we find the delivery funding to get these uh, programs administered. Specifically for the 31.6 million, we need to promote it, get out there and tell businesses it's available. We need to develop uh, a pipeline of projects to access this funding, and we need to work with the market. That's subsidising rent points. We need to be very careful that we don't discourage private sector investments. On a wider point, as a city region, we've been very successful in terms of the local growth fund. We are now um, the ninth of 39 in terms of per capita amounts received um, as a result of local growth funding. We need more projects to submit for future bidding rounds into government. We don't have business case ready projects to submit. So an example would be the elements of the innovation plan, and there's a presentation today on that. They need to be developed alongside all other projects so that we've actually got a, a, a list of projects to bid into government. Reiterate the point at the end as well. We have done quite well, so we know that when we take that message to government, and when uh, members, you, you lobby government as well, when we've got the business case too, we, we do do very well if we are successful in obtaining the funds that we, we're asking for. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Mike. Uh, right, members, questions, Joe. On, on the question of the go back a slide and we look at the split in terms of funding and, and it's to support business and, and, and um, the, you know, growth in terms of business opportunity. Is it not an, a really good opportunity and, 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 and you know, it's a question really and we need to possibly look at it, is that if we look at the challenges that we all face within the
not an, an issue here for the, 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 the left, who's, if you like, the accountable or where the accountable body does this from them, to develop new ways of working with those social, ed social enterprises and the social ed enterprise network to look how we look at the bigger picture. I'm not just talking about tinkering, but for instance, developing you know, you know, uh, elderly people's care villages and stuff, whatever that can provide support for people in those developments, say, tell them the whole city region and, and take the pressures off the NHS and stuff. With, but in, in terms of, you know, let's look for, for an example, and, and, and just, again, just sticking with this one issue. For instance, some of the Dallas proxies, some of the grade two list of buildings that we've got, we can turn them into uh, social enterprises that actually support uh, the accommodation for elderly people across the piece. And, and we can train people to refurbish them, we can provide the, the investments in, in, into that using some of this money. But we get a longer return of, of it with, with the NHS and other partners, as strategic partners within this particular sector. So where, where there's no one to be supporting the private sector to take advantage of the funding. Can we maybe use this opportunity to use some of that funding to get out there and work with the social enterprise networks mm -hmm. or have a, an opportunity for a wider discussion? Because you know, what money is made, the whole city region is faced with a real challenge about sustainability and we provide services and protect services <coughs> with limited amounts of money. And so we've got to do things differently. And so I just think it's a great opportunity for to us to look at the bigger picture on, on just that issue for health for, for the, as an example, but there are many other things for health alone. Is there a way of doing that? Is there a way of using some of that funding to, to, to provide the revenue support to actually engage the SEN, for instance, that sector to work with the health yeah. service and stuff? Is there a way of doing that? I, I think it's something we, we, we should be seriously considering. I'll just move back onto that slide because of the red at the bottom. Um, we have to submit business cases to the government. <coughs> and this particular project, the business grew up to 15.6 million. The letter we have received says that they, we still have to submit some further business case. We, we've already had the IGF previously approved, so they've got to agree what can find a business case. What I've, I've said to Biz, and Biz are actually attending to, to view this, this session today, is that don't just assume we want to do what we did before. Actually, let us have a look at this funding and see if we can find a better way of using it. And I know that within the LEP, um, part of the innovation plan is how do we uh, stratify medicine, etc. The, these innovative areas in health, where you can actually better profile the population effects. And actually, maybe we could grow some businesses in the city region off the back of that by being the first mover in that area. I know that's something that's, that's in the innovation plan. And again, we should be looking at uh, maximum flexibility with this funding so that we can channel it to where we think the priority is uh, and not always be stuck with whatever it was, government said we should use the funding for. And it certainly will consider that. Just, just what, what position, Chair, do you, is it, you know, I accept that with UKCI or whoever it is or, or, or whatever, should be absolutely delighted that we're looking at, uh, if you like, using funding uh, uh, like this, in, in a sense of, uh, in, in a way that's invested in or invested say, and that's what I'm talking about, because clearly the, the, um, the, the, we all want to, or, or central government wants, is the uh, funding to be better used uh, in, in whatever way. If we can find a model that supports the social network, for instance, to get able to support sort of the policies and health service by investing and getting jobs and training out of it and so reducing the pressures on the NHS, that sort of thing, which is welcome. So my, 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 my ask is, is that we use either some revenue, let's get people together, let's get the SEM talking, and let's talk about, instead of tinkering at the edges, yeah, working with the NHS, working with UKTI or whoever uh, from or, or biz or, or whatever to see if we can get a model <coughs> that can works that can help us tackle some of the problems, the pressures that we face in the future. I think mean, that's certainly what we, we do, and it would be a collective effort on our part. Uh, the, the model for the regional for, for the local growth fund is hopefully it's devolved to us for us to find the thing that's that, that's best for us. And, we need to hold that line with government. Who best knows what the local area needs? It's actually the, the local area itself. So we're, we're definitely going to have that conversation with government over the next few weeks to understand and, and push for maximum flexibility in how we use this funding uh, locally to get local benefits. Okay, Robert. Yeah. Just speaking of that, very important. I, I do think that two and two should make five, and that's a question of, of impact. 
this impact which, which helps social enterprise networks and also the health of uh, other issues in the city region. So to bring people together on that basis, by to, to actually have a gathering of people who understand the ability to take it forward in that direction. I'm going to present a business case to government based upon those aspirations. It's obviously what is the way forward. So I think it's to understand what, what, what can be done, the ultimate possible, understand the ultimate reach in terms of social, economic and health impact, and then present that, that position to government and get approval, hopefully, for the next round, which can accommodate that, uh, that ambition. As is the case, uh, we've the, the lab met with the social enterprise network this week, um, earlier on this week, specifically on how do we um, make best impact with the funding available. And there, there's an argument that it's a bit too crowded a landscape at the minute, and actually we just need to understand what uh, product best delivers growth and best helps that social enterprises grow. Um, so we're already having those conversations, and it will be part of any business case we put forward. Okay, um, any other <coughs> questions? Mike, can I, can I just ask one, one quick question? Um, and um, you won't be surprised, because I ask this question every time you make this presentation. And I think fantastic results to have another 30 odd million uh, to add to, to everything else. And I think I've seen a slide where you've presented all the different pots of money come to over a billion, which is a, a fantastic achievement. And you know, to be 9,039 leps is, is, um, is a really good result. However, and I think you touched on it at the end, um, delivery is, is key. Um, no, no additional funding for managing this, all these pots of money. Um, I suppose the concern is great that we've got uh, extra money, but what are we doing to make sure that we can deliver? Because at the end of the day, that is the key. A, a piece of work has been underway, um, primarily focusing on transport initially. There's 180 of the original 232 million was transport funding, mapping specifically what we need to be able to deliver. We need to take that piece of work now and extend it to these other budget areas, because these are, these are different programs, so they need different capabilities and different capacity. So it would be um, <coughs> with the, the permission of members to so actually go away and extend that mapping exercise to the skills domain where we've got funding and this economic development domain. So we can actually fully understand what delivery capacity we now need for these additional funding sources. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. It's, 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 it's worthwhile noting in this particular issue that the um, voluntary committee and faith sector, sector really, if they're right, if they have written the right people. Just come a bit closer to you, Mike. Well, writing, the, the voluntary committee and faith sector are chief executives of writing to all the uh, leaders uh, about the ability of the capacity of the voluntary community and faith sector to help with the aspirations of the combined democracy. It partly makes sense to the points that Joe made. But it's worthwhile that there is a, an awful lot of capacity out there in things like the voluntary community and faith sector to help the combined democracy to uh, achieve its aspirations, yes. not least which through this sort of process. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And I think that sector needs to be factored in too. Discussions you're having, Mike, about, about how we can deliver this. Anything else, uh, members? So, can I can I just suggest first of all welcome the additional funding that, that uh, we've got. I think we need to congratulate Mike and, and the team um, at the left who coordinated all of this. And uh, I think we look forward to uh, future presentations to the combined authority about how the uh, work around delivery is uh, is progressive. So, can we agree that, members? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that then takes us on to item number six, which is the Liverpool City Region uh, Innovation Plan. And uh, pleased that we've got um, Alan Welby, <coughs> the Executive Director from the left, to just take us through this plan. Alan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just quickly talk through the context um, in the paper very quickly before giving you a very short presentation about the Innovation Plan itself. Uh, I'm happy to take any more detailed questions on the project. So asking you to endorse the, um, the, the plan at the draft <laughs> stage, we'll go through to, cons go through to consultation um, over the next couple of weeks and then launch. Similarly, we'd like um, the combined authority to endorse our approach to start having a dialogue with government <coughs> to position this as one of our next big planks um, for a growth deal, uh, a combined approach to innovation uh, across a variety of different uh, government departments 
to really kind of stoke our innovation uh, 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 process. Um, the plan itself has been <coughs> led and developed by the Innovation Board, which was chaired by Sir Howard Newby, going forward now, um, chaired by Jonathan Haig, um, uh, Vice President of um, uh, Unilever. Um, it's been an extensive consultation, extensive working through with a variety of partners, and, and builds on a lot of great success that we've seen in the city and region um, in innovation. Um, Enterprise Zone bid has been um, um, announced earlier, but the 113 million at Hartley Centre, particularly, I think, is really significant investment that was announced um, at the autumn statement around big data and high performance computing. Um, the document you've got in your pack is, is uh, sort of a, a covering document. It will be turned into a glossy. Um, it's also supported by a, a strategic activity plan, very much a detailed action plan and a, a vast evidence base as well, um, if, if people ask me why we come to these decisions, etc. Um, the, the plan itself very much focuses on collaboration. Um, all the projects there are about driving um, collaboration. There are millions of innovation projects across the city region. It's not hoping to capture a single one of those. This is about focusing on big scale transformative collaborations. Um, and also the plan is not really a strategy, it's a plan, it's about delivery about really trying to make a step change in how we deliver programs and get a track record of delivering innovation projects at scale. In terms of resourcing that plan, um, ERDF, this will be a key framework for how we spend ERDF. The challenge, of course, is we don't have any near amount of money in ERDF that we'd like to spend on this. Um, there's about uh, 26 million um, ERDF and, and 6 million ESF. Um, and already in the dialogue with partners, we've got an ask of about 130 ERDF already. So um, the key, I think, will be um, using ERDF and ESF as a catalyst for funding, um, particularly with the growth deal, and private sector investment as well. And then finally, in terms of context, this, this sits within a, in a wider context. We talked about the north of transport. But very much innovation doesn't work just in, in one borough or one city region. It works at scale and, and, and across boundaries. So, um, very important, this, this works with colleagues um, in, in Cheshire Let, Manchester Let, colleagues at Edge Hill University as well, really to create an integrated approach to that scale. That's um, sort of the context. In terms of um, the plan itself, you know, very much the document you've got will be a, uh, an external prospectus for government, uh, the private sector and investors. Um, not just an R&D plan, there's a, a lot of focus on science here, which may confuse and, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, bewilder some people, but also there's a key element there of social innovation. This um, carries on Mayor Anderson's point about um, the challenges facing public sector reform. I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Uh, very much a, a framework for activity for the Innovation Board and, and partners, um, and, and supported by our strategic activity plan as well. Why innovation? Why is innovation important? Well, basically, if, if places are trying to compete, compete in a global marketplace, very difficult to compete on cost now. Very difficult to compete on the products you make um, competing on cost in a global marketplace. You've got to compete on, on either your knowledge, so can you develop new products that other people can't develop, R&D, or can you make, make things that other people can't make, so advanced manufacturing, or can you brand or design things in a way that other people can't do? So that's where the added value happens. Places that don't understand innovation and change and economic change will get will lag behind. So we really need to be ahead of that, positioning ourselves to compete in a global uh, marketplace. Um, cities are becoming more alike, so it's where you get that competitive advantage really um, comes through. And innovation really, really is the key to unlocking that. Um, Obviously a key driver at, at the UK level for government and a key driver at the EU level as well. And, and let's be honest, the rest of the country is not standing still. If they got, they got their act together, if you know, just look at the, 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 I personally think the tragic effects of um, AstraZeneca moving from Alderley Edge to Cambridge. They're not moving you know, to another country there, they're just moving across the, across the country. So we need to compete, we need to make our places and our environments sticky. So it's about maximizing our assets. We do have a lot of assets. Um, you know, Matt, you go through a lot, a lot of activity we have here in terms of uh, capability, either in hospitals, <laughs> universities, companies, uh, real two significant clusters on a national and international scale. I talked about scale being very important. So Daresbury, um, one of two national big science campuses, 
and to similarly in a sort of knowledge quarter in, in, in Liverpool, um, significant cluster of activity. But, but there is activity across the wider city region as well. Have significant companies as well that drive innovation here. Um, some of those large scale, some of those medium scale, some of those smaller growing companies. And some good networks as well. The challenge is we just don't have enough. Um, and that's the real challenge facing our economy going forward. We've got a good mix of, of, of assets in terms of um, people, places, and financial infrastructure as well. So a good amount of <coughs> space. Uh, some well-developed funds like the Northwest Fund now coming through in, in terms of um, MSF as well. Significant assets in terms of the student base as well. So we have things to build on. We have significant um, activity. The challenge is to do that better, connect that better, and, and make an impact. I, I would say that when people in, in government departments are thinking about places with innovation hotspots, they're not necessarily thinking about ourselves in the city region. We've got to transform that, um, and we've got to transform that to, to, to private investment as well. Very complicated slide. I don't expect you to look at this, but, but basically what you see here, these are all the different kind of players that, that create our innovation ecosystem. What's pretty clear is it's not connected. We're not maximizing that well enough. We're not punching our weight in terms of um, collaborating and prioritizing activity. And this is what the innovation plan is about, to try and get a much more coherent um, approach. Similarly, very clear coming through the plan, we've got a significant amount of challenges to really maximize our opportunities here. We need more businesses, have some significant players here, but a lot of their R&D is based elsewhere. We're, we're we're manufacturing our activity here, not necessarily creating it here, so we need to create those, those more businesses, grow our own particularly. Um, the companies we have here are not uh, innovative enough. We've got a lot of uh, family-owned companies may not necessarily see the need for innovation, so a, a danger further down the line. So we need to get those companies much more innovative going forward as well. S a challenge around skills, notwithstanding the amount of, um, of uh, students we have here, we need to upskill our our workforce for the future activities and, and, um, and skills we'll need in the future as well. Finance for innovation, we have uh, some, some products at the moment here, but uh, particularly we need to lever in more private investors uh, and, and allow private sector investors to, to back the companies to grow as well. We need a better amount of uh, networks, so connecting ourselves not just within the city region, but across the north and internationally as well. And then finally, governance. I think one of the challenges we've faced in the past, we've had great ideas, not always put them in the back of the net. So we've got to hold ourselves to account and deliver on this. So very quickly, um, the Innovation Plan, very much a framework for activity, um, building on our major centres and assets and, and trying to address some of those key challenges. Last slide from me, which gives you an overview of what the, what's in the plan itself. I'll quickly take you through the, 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 the 12 projects we've got. So there are five key areas of activity, um, four sectors, so health and well-being, uh, solutions to sustainable growth, so building on our low carbon and blue, uh, our maritime assets, advanced manufacturing and creative and digital, and then this area will call the innovation ecosystem. So that confusing map I showed you about connecting that much better, making this place stickier for people to work in. The bubbles you see, they're the 12 focus projects we're, we're working on. So at the end of this is very much about delivery, about focusing on, on getting these projects in the back of the net um, and, and getting ourselves a track record with investors, with government, that we can deliver things at scale and, and at pace. So taking you through those very quickly, um, health and well-being, the first cluster there, um, the two projects that we're focusing on is Stratified Health. This is led by a partnership in, in the NHS, the Liverpool Health Partners, very much focuses on translational research on, on personalized medicine, so genomics. People understand the human genome, that will transform the med medicine and services that people will get in the NHS. Um, predicted 20% more R&D, global R&D, put on personalized medicine by 2020, all global R&D companies. We've got significant assets in this, in this space here in the city region. What we're not good at is translating that into products. So that will be a very much a, a commercialization program. My Liverpool um, is a large-scale program partnership between the CCG and uh, Innovate UK around assisted living, so helping people live in their homes for longer, dealing very much with some of the issues that uh, Mayor Anderson talked about. That's a significant um, £16 million program at the moment, looking at technology, but we've been working with partners to broaden that out, looking very much about um, the future of social innovation and public sector delivery. So 
where, how can we grow uh, local economies around the transformation of this? I would say here the local authorities are ahead of the game of the NHS on that. We've been doing a lot of work with four of the local authorities on the patch. You are facing some of those challenges slightly more um, readily than the NHS, but I envisage that, that my Liverpool 2, the second programme that will, will be a, a very large scale um, programme looking to engage with social enterprises to deliver innovative solutions for care, care in the future. Um, advanced manufacturing, uh, a lot of work has been done on that, the whole making it process that we, we work through. Materials innovation factory, a big um, uh, programme, the partnership between University of Liverpool and Unilever, looking at manufacturing the molecular scale, so um, creating new products into the market there. That, that again, significantly backed by Hefke, so £46 million worth of money gone into that, and we'll have an open innovation model, so kit will be shared by lots of partners, you can use it together, it will create an environment where this will be a truly um, global hub for, for new materials. Sensor City, um, uh, building on the University Enterprise Zone of the two universities around sensor technologies, again, very important, this will be, will be going to lots of different sectors, sensors will go into your cars, go into medical devices, you know, people are wearing personal sensors at the moment, so again a big transformative step going forward. And then the opportunities to link in with the Manufacturing Technology Centre in Coventry as well, led by um, uh, the City Council. Creative Digital, um, again trying to create a collective programme around support for the creative digital sector. Quite <coughs> tricky and challenging, this we have a lot of small companies, very fast moving sectors, so the public sector engagement with them is more challenging. Um, uh, long-term discussions with the Catapult Centre in London about creating a node here in Liverpool and uh, partners trying to develop a, a what's called a frictionless content platform, so using content to create more jobs as well. Solutions to sustainable growth, two big projects there. First would be the Marine Energy Deployment and Operations Centre, based on some of the assets we've got on the Wirral, um, the opportunities around offshore renewables, really to create a, a centre there in, in world-leading um, understanding of how we deploy and, de and develop marine energy operations there, opportunities around the test tank. And then the hydrogen network, which is um, an opportunity based on byproduct of hydrogen coming from the Ineos Claw plant in, in, in um, Halton, pipelines underneath <coughs> that plant leading to locations like the Heath and Daresbury. You should be able to access hydrogen on tap. That'll give you a critical advantage. If you're a company that needs hydrogen very cheaply, um, if you can create that network, that will be a real game changer. Finally, um, the three programs in the innovation ecosystem. SciTech Daysbury, a very well-developed public-private partnership between STFC, Horton Council, Langtree, really making sure that we um, maintain that, that, that prominence in government size and investment size. Um, Liverpool Knowledge Quarter, it's a mayoral development zone, really making the step change in terms of how partners deliver and, and drive that, making sure that, again, the opportunities is marketed to the world significant building going on there over the next couple of years, Copper Hill development, etc., uh, the new hospital. So how do we maximise and really create that as an opportunity for growth? Big data, um, I talked about the investment going to head at the Hayekry Centre around high performance computing. Um, big data will transform how we operate, how the public sector will operate and how um, uh, uh, companies will operate and interrogate data, a real opportunity for growth. And then finally, Innovation Exchange, that's about trying to pull together all the business support programs in the innovation space and create a much more streamlined program as part of the business framework. That's it. Thanks very much for that, Alan. Um, okay, members, questions, comments? Okay, Robert? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, really congratulate you, Alan, on this paper. It's been uh, I know a gestation for some time. It's taken several months to move to where it is today. But it is born out of original thinking. gathering opportunities, define them, and uh, especially in a way which we can take forward in, in, in the future. So, so well done. I think also it is vital for any uh, city, region like ourselves, has to have these credentials. Uh, you can see many cities in Europe and in the UK with this opportunity and ambition. Uh, for us to do it, it's a prerequisite, it's not something desirable, it's essential. It also drives economic growth, jobs of quality, well-paid jobs, and increases perception and how people uh, view us reputationally, absolutely vital for our purpose. It's, as always, it's translation into delivery and actual, not just a plan, not just a program, but jobs and projects on the ground. And therefore, 
that to me is a key. What are the next steps? Are they to a time scale? The ecology is different, I understand that. But the, the, the need to be actually disciplined in our delivery aspect is, is, is vital. And finally, just on, we do have a shared example of how this can work in practice already. Agglomeration, growth, backing winners, it's Darsbury. SciTech Darsbury is an example of what's been happening here in this region for the last seven or eight years, backed by the NWDA. It is now a national centre of scientific excellence, one of the two in the UK. I think it's fantastic. And that will grow because it's mature, it has the ability, the confidence, and the knowledge within it. And we hope these four programmes will emulate that success. So, very well done. Okay. In terms of next step, thank you, Robert. Um, it, it's, we are working day and night with partners to get these projects up and ready, really. Um, some of them are, are up and ready, they're ready to go. Um, but it's about the next step. Um, making sure that when the first call comes out for the RDF program, which will be in March, that uh, you know, 130 million asks, they're not all going to get that money. So how do we use that money effectively and smartly to act as the catalyst? How do we get these partnerships um, working um, together on that? The, the, next, the next sort of um, uh, timetable would be, I'd like to take that whole program to government uh, and ask uh, for a deal around all those 12 programs. Um, uh, and, and, and we have the governance in place then to sign that deal with government to ensure delivery. Uh, it just means we are working through with those programs to make sure, A, what the ask would be of government, B, um, you know, are they rock solid in terms of delivery, how would extra investment really advance and accelerate that. Um, and we're getting there with most of, the, most of these, just including pieces of work with um, local health partners on the Stratified Medicine side of things. Uh, but uh, I, I think, um, we, we should be in a very good place to really start training this with um, civil servants over the next couple of months. A more informal um, discussion with, with politicians post the next election, then leading to a significant bid into a, uh, a next round of a growth deal at scale. Uh, and that's, I think, the key thing. If we can pull that off, which I really hope we can, that will put us ahead of the game. Most of the LEPs in the country have done a very bitty piece approach to and this project and go in there. If we can create a big project, we'll put ourselves on the map it will try and start to position ourselves as a place to get things done, innovation we understand, and a partner of government and private sector to do that. Okay, well, uh, Ronnie. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just, um, just to comment to uh, section three of the report, Alan, and I've raised similar issues in this very chamber uh, last year, uh, and I've told you my experience, and it's about uh, reason for young uh, students who just got first in Liverpool University uh, when I questioned where they were going to work etc uh, they were all going back home now I know you can't do anything about the international uh, students who go away with first and uh, all going back home understandably I asked a question last year of how do we stop the outward migration of our young students who come out of university with first, how do we retain them? Because we continue to talk about the lack of high level skills, uh, which we've got all the ideas in the local city region. Unfortunately, we're short on retaining the people, young students, with the skills to deliver a lot of what we've been talking about this morning. Uh, skills is right at the heart of it, isn't it? Um, you know, the for those those young people, they've got to see an opportunity <coughs> here. Um, and I, and I, the approach that we're taking is to try and embed skills into all those twelve programs, because um, I think it's easier, I think, to prioritise activity. So if we can create a sensor a sensor economy here, um, with lots of companies that are working through that, and align the universities to provide those students, and there's some kind of conveyor belt pushing those through. through through, through for their careers, so an easy step going from from um, uh, Centre City into uh, the City Centre into a company. That's what we want, where we want. So we make those pathways as, as clear as possible. Um, and all of those, I think, we're, we're looking at to try and develop a, a, a skills, not just a high level skills, but a skills dimension to it. So they'll have discussions with partners at Site Affairs about that and across the board on that. Um, whether, whether we'll crack that overnight. That, that, that will be a challenge because the mix that we have at the moment isn't quite there. As I said, we need more companies um, to take those, 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 those people forward as well. So, and that will come 
I think that's a more of a medium term game. I think, Ronnie, you, you raised a good point graduate retention uh, within the city media has been a challenge which we've been looking at for many years now. And I think I think we're going to be we're missing a trick if we don't link that issue to this innovation plan. I think it's it's critical really that you know we take advantage of our homegrown talent, so particularly you know, moving into employment. So um, I think we need to keep our eye on that. So, so, <coughs> so take that concept around my little we If we can crack that concept of developing a joined up. Um, economy around social care, um, that the positions here is a place that understands that future economy of an aging population, we create those social enterprise opportunities, <coughs> deliver those services which aren't going to be delivered through the NHS, etc. Now, if, we, if we've got colleges aligned to that, and we're starting to get that, the universities aligned to that, so they're getting the right students to go to it, and then we've also got the companies through, then, then that really is about pure economic development. I can't see a bigger opportunity for us. Aligning all that is not easy, um, but, that, but that's why we're trying to do less and really focus on delivery. Uh, and David. Uh, yes, thank you. A very uh, thought-provoking uh, report and presentation, uh, and vital work. Um, West Lancashire will do, do well out of this if it comes off with great wealth and growth in the future. I agree entirely about the, the, the need to keep our best graduates in the Northwest. Also, often you know, your friends, their children are the degrees were only working after they've got a good degree. They come down south or even abroad, um, and these are the people who create wealth in the future. But I'm pleased you uh, mentioned Ed Hill, who uh, are developing the, the business side of their activities, uh, and uh, there is um, uh, uh, high tech companies in West Africa. Um, we have, um, I can't remember the name, it's NSG, the old Huntington's Research and Development yeah. Laboratory in Maiden. I believe they have capacity. And there are other companies there. Uh, and if, if you ask them, they'll think they're in the, the city region. Mm -hmm. so. Or they may not think of themselves in any region, they just want access to innovation. Um, and the, the point in the global world, if you're not getting a competitive advantage for your location, i.e. some kind of added, you know, then it's very tempting to go and move elsewhere. Can we make that the use of our assets as effectively as possible? They can be people, universities, finance and variety of things, but that's that's where I'd like to get to that in the future that you know when somebody gets into a cab, you know, in Nosley or Liverpool, that the cab drivers there talking about this innovation economy and the way they can talk about a football economy or a cultural economy because they've seen that transformation happen. <coughs> but it happens to people's lives that they Jim is getting a job in, in a high tech company. That's that's my opinion. Okay, and uh, finally I'm gonna ask Joe and then we'll move on to Joe. Just a quick point is that it has to be you know, it has to be also, except for the point about graduate retention and long term, it should be at the heart of you know, a lot of things that we do. We, we can't disassociate that from other social things, like, for instance, accommodation needs and stuff like that. In terms of graduate retention, it isn't just about the skills issue, it's about what else we provide. And we have a paucity of accommodation, and, and equally, we have uh, not really grasped the need to incentivize. Uh, graduates to stay by working with the health sector or, or, or whatever to provide accommodation needs. So all of that has to be looked at in the whole. It's just not just one section. That's fine, you know, offering jobs. But we also need accommodation. We also need to make sure that they've got that. That's why we're losing people from the health sector, the health service, who qualify in the city and go out and move. And we've got to try and address that particular issue. So when we're building accommodation, people like us the accommodation and, and said that you know it's student flats. Well, a lot of it isn't. It's about making sure that the sector that we need, like health and stuff, whatever, they've got accommodation, affordable accommodation that helps them get on the ladder. So within that particular picture on that, what I mentioned before, we need to factor in that point as well. Okay, um, Peter. Yes, yeah, I think I think that's a really crucial point because this is this is a jigsaw. I think there's an issue for me, the, it's, the, it's the, the issue that they're not speaking to name is in relation to housing and things like development plans, which is a positive planning framework, potentially building on green belt, because we're looking at brownfield site saving in my neck of woods. Um, and these are issues that if we want to address you know, the economic growth of the, of the county, of the city region, um, these are some of those issues that we're going to have to tackle because we're often hearing people saying, 
house. My children move away because they can't get a house in the area, they can't do this, they can't do that. And that leads to can't get a, they can't get a job. And it's a thing. But I think for me, it's this whole question about trying to get to grip with the what amounts to, in my view, um, the NIMBY approach to, uh, to development. I mean, I'm not that it's got to stop, I don't want to stop people being NIMBY, but there is a significant fact that people don't want development in their area because of having a green belt and not the right land or having green space. And really, we don't have the uh, capacity to ignore that, uh, to, to tackle that, really. Uh, so that's a fact as well. I'm not going to ask you to comment on green belts and all that. So do, uh, Alan, you'd be pleased to know. But I think it's just something that needs to kind of stay on our radar because it, it's inextricably linked, isn't it, with, with what we've been talking about. So can we thank Alan for the presentation? And members, I'm just going to turn you to the recommendations in the report, uh, page 11, paragraph 2. So we're being asked to endorse the Liverpool City Region Innovation Plan, uh, ready for consultation and a formal launch and support engagement with government uh, on the plan, and particularly around seeking investments in the various projects and programs uh, as part of the growth, future growth plan discussion. So can we agree those recommendations? Yes, okay, thank you very much. Okay, that then takes us on to agenda item seven, which is the 2015-2016 Mersey Tunnel Tolls uh, report. And I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Liam Robinson to present the 1516 uh, report. Thanks, Liam. Yeah, thanks very much. Obviously, members have got the uh, report in front of them. Uh, however, Mersey Travel Committee have met yesterday to consider the recommendation that we are sending forward to you, and I believe that's been circulated. Uh, but very briefly, we're recommending to the Combined Authority a freeze on all Mersey tunnel tolls, both. Uh, fast tag and cash uh, tolls for all class of vehicles. The rationale is quite straightforward. Under the Mersey Tunnels Act 2004, uh, we have discretion to take on board economic and social factors, and we acknowledge that whilst there is some growth in the local economy, welcome as that is, uh, we're mindful of the fact that that is not uniform and strong across uh, the city region. So because of that, we acknowledge that tunnel tolls are part of transport costs which do have an effect on the local economy and are proposing that freeze. Uh, as part of that, we uh, acknowledge and we hope that transport operators will reflect on this, particularly large bus companies or even stagecoach, act accordingly and call them to at least freeze their uh, fares that they charge or much better bring back some more cost effective and value for money options. But specifically with regard to the tunnel tolls of 2015 and 16, the Mersey Travel Committee has recommended to the Combined Authority a freeze on all tolls for the next financial year. Okay, thanks Liam for that. Um, now, we've got uh, <coughs> uh, a, a motion which um, Joe Anderson is going to move, and I'm going to second, and I think we've got copies which we can circulate around to colleagues. Um, members, of, members have got it. So that's gone round. So Joe, do you, do you want to uh, introduce this motion, please? Yeah, just, just uh, the motion uh, reads, uh, Chair, that the, uh, yourself, the Chair of the Combined Authority, set up a task group to consider the options open to the Combined Authority to reduce costs of tunnel tolls uh, and its impact on infrastructure and transportation. The head of paid service uh, of the Combined Authority to produce a report for discussion to inform the setting of tunnel tolls for 2016-2017 uh, and beyond, and the uh, combined authority to press for a review of the Mersey Tunnel Act in any ongoing <coughs> uh, devolution implicated in the negotiations. I think, Jay, just, just uh, asking the, the members uh, to, to support it, I think it, it is absolutely right that you know, we look at um, the, the tolls and we uh, argue that we have done, you, I, and each and every uh, local authority member here for the discrepancy between uh, investment in transport infrastructure in the south of the country compared to the north. And you know, for me, um, I think it's um, 
something that we have to actually force hold um, how we believe that the tools that we've been paying, uh, people have been paying for those tools for decades now, and, and we still haven't been able to eradicate the debt. So there's two issues. One for me that we need to address uh, as a combined authority, how we uh, take money from the tolls and invest that in infrastructure. I think that's uh, fundamentally wrong. I think all of the profits that are made from the tolls should go to try and down the toll costs. So I'm asking for the review of that uh, by uh, this combined authority and also for us to take in uh, to the part of negotiations with government on trade and devolution, how we can remove the Tunnel Act itself or we negotiate the Tunnel Act. We all accept that there has to be uh, investment in it in terms of being able to maintain it and keep it operating and also the staff costs. So a renegotiation of the Act or, or, or an ability for us to change the Act is what we should be aiming for. So that's all it's calling for uh, a task group to be set up, uh, including the chair of me, uh, travel itself and the Okay, thanks for that, Joe. Um, I'll, I'll second it. Second. If there's any other members wish to, I don't think Lisa. Can I, can I, yeah, can I make a comment uh, on that? And I think this is a, an eminently sensible proposal, and I think it's uh, it's timely as well. I mean, the ten years of all the act. I think things have moved on. Developments in the city region. Um, and I, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to uh, to take up the task to review all elements of this. <coughs> this okay. Well, can I? Um, I'll formally formally second um, the resolution that Joe has moved. I mean, I, can I first of all say from, from the chair? I, mean, I, I do welcome the the freeze um, uh, that the, the committee yesterday made. I know um, certainly from where my Rural leaders' hats. Uh, certainly, my residents. Um, I know uh, we're well that. You know, we're already struggling with lots of cost limiting challenges. So I think that's that's really good news. And, and I think um, Peter, your comment, it is timely that actually we, we do look at the whole, um, you know, the whole range of different <coughs> costings and pricing, etc., for the tunnel tolls. Because you know, we seem to go through this annual um, process, and it seems that. Um, inexorably increase year on year. So I mean, I, I, I do think it is a good idea to um, set up a task group where we can look at them in, in depth at all of these issues. And I think it, it's absolutely, uh, again, the timing is, is excellent in terms of the devolution agenda. Um, and that really plays into to that and to our asks. And I know the discussion is going to start shortly at official level uh, between um, ourselves and the government. Uh, and I know this is going to be David, one of the uh, the items on the uh, on the agenda. So uh, I think uh, we could make some rapid progress on this and, and just start to make more um, you know more sensible decisions about this this huge kind of uh, uh, burden that we've been facing with for, for years, but never really never really kind of tackled in a sensible way. So I, I'm delighted to um, second uh, Joe's uh, resolution. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask um, members, can we agree? But I need to just point out um, uh, Rob Polhill as uh, leader of Holton. Holton aren't formally part of the tunnel to tunnels legislation. So, Rob, I think you want to just uh, register your, your yeah. position. Yeah, David, can I have my abstention, please? Uh, reason being that Holton isn't part of the legislation. So, so we'll formally we'll formally record that, Rob, in a minute. So, can I, can I we've got the, the resolution in the Excuse me, Mr. Chair, the, there's various parts that the audience have been able to hear, and what Councillor Pearl has said then, okay. heard by the audience. Okay. By the public. Uh, right, so I'll just read out the resolution, the resolution again. Sorry, I'll You've got the resolution. The Right, the, the point yeah, that Castle Pole, Hill. Castle Pole Hill, the point Castle Pole Hill made is that Holton Council are not formally part of the, of the legislative arrangements around the, the, the Mersey Tunnels Act. So he's registered his uh, intention to abstain from any decision on this item. Is that okay? Great. For the record, well, yeah, I do not vote on this. You are not voting as well. Okay, Thank so with, with those qualifications, can I ask members, can we agree that resolution? Agreed. That's good.
disagree. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, so that then takes us then to item eight, which is the 2015-16 budget uh, financial perspective. And, and John, you want to take us through this, please? The CA's account also includes non-Mersey travel, if you like, non-Mersey travel income and expenditure, and that relates in particular to the growth fund, the growth deal, integrated transport block and highways maintenance funding, which have each been subject to further discussion and further agreement by the combined authority. It should also be noted that this budget has been set after very intense and detailed collaboration with each of our district partners in establishing budget and in particularly in particular we're very mindful of the impact that levies have on individual districts if they to set their own budgets. And with that, this levy reduction shows that Mersey Travel was recognising its need to assist in that um, in that in, with the financial difficulties that the districts are in in setting a budget and put our shoulders to the wheel. But we also have to be mindful of the importance of strategic infrastructure investment in transport in particular, in generating the type of economic growth that will be necessary to replace the revenues that councils are, are, are losing through the reduction of revenues for grants um, with, with more sustainable local resources. In terms of Halton, very briefly, the financial arrangements in respect of Halton will continue for the next 12 months, those being that Halton will set its own transport which is part of its main transport through council tax requirements and any move to a differential levy will not take place next year and would only take place after detailed consideration. Finally, there is an adjustment to the budget which we can circulate, and that's with respect to the previous agenda item, and that would see a reduction in tunnels income of 1.1 million pound with a corresponding adjustment to the amount that's transferred to, to our reserves for capital finance and investment. It doesn't have any effect on the levy. And with that, I, I think Councillor Robinson would also like to say a couple of words around Mersey Travel's deliberations yesterday. Yeah, thanks for that. Really, just to kind of present the, the budget to the uh, combined authority. Very much want to pay tribute to John and the team and all the financial teams across the districts for what's been a lot of very detailed, close work over numerous months uh, to bring this towards you um, today. Obviously, we fully acknowledge the fact that um, because of central government cuts, all the districts across the city region are really suffering real financial pain. And it's absolutely right that Mersey Travel does everything we can to cut our cloth accordingly to assist with that and make sure we're part of the financial solution, not adding to the burden of it. So the budget work we deliberated over and agreed yesterday that bring it forward for your recommendation is one that's very practical, very deliberable, and one that we hope will uh, build on the success of Okay, thanks.
Thanks, Lynn. Uh, okay, now Liz, so you've got the recommendations in front of you uh, in paragraph two, the report, page 57. Can we agree those recommendations? We agree. Yeah, and can I endorse my thanks to John and Tim for the hard work he's done on that? Thank you very much. Okay, that takes us then to item um, nine, which is the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority Code of Corporate Governance. And John, this is you again, please. Again, uh, very briefly. Has been to the Combined Authorities Audit and Governance Committee and been considered in some detail, and they're recommending the adoption of this to the Combined Authority. Just to point out, though, since publication of the agenda, some very minor presentational and, and, and contextual errors have been identified. So, as well as recommending the, this report approved, we're also seeking um, seeking delegated powers from myself and the monitoring officer with the chair to amend those before this is actually published. Okay, thanks for, for that uh, clarification, John. So we're looking uh, again at recommendations on uh, page 71 of this report. Can we uh, approve uh, those corporate governance changes? I agree. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, just finally, a few items on the minutes. So item 10 are the minutes of the Mersey Travel Committee held on the 15th of January. Uh, can I ask members, can we confirm these minutes? They agreed? Thank you very much. And finally, the minutes of the audit committee held on the 13th of January. Can we <coughs> confirm those minutes? They agreed. Okay, uh, I've not been uh, informed of any other urgent items, so can I uh, thank you for your attendance and contribution to this meeting, remind you that the next meeting of the Combined Authority will be at 11.30 a.m. on Friday the 6th of March 2015, and I declare the meeting closed. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you.